Hello, everybody. This is Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. Welcome to the show. We are going to uh, do something a little bit special on this very risk-off day in markets. Um, I promise uh, I did not kick the markets over all by myself. I had this plan to talk about what we're going to talk about today um, going into the consternation uh, and um, was thinking about it yesterday. But what a perfect day. Uh, to be talking about um, this, uh, we are going to be focused on the Australian dollar. And what we're going to talk about is not just the Australian dollar, the currency, although we'll certainly do that, um, and not just as a tradable asset unto itself, we'll certainly do that. We're going to be talking about, likewise, the Australian dollar as an indicator. And as an indicator of global recession, of global economic downturn. So let's break it down here. We have a little bit of Australian economic data to give us context, but it'll be the broader relationships that will be key here and what they say about recession risk. So let's start. The first thing uh, that we look at here, um, this is uh, the Australian dollar against um, the US dollar, 6A futures. You can see here a number of touch points that I've outlined that really ought to have been supportive and were not. So what you're looking at is really uh, since early 2021, the Australian dollar very clearly trending lower against USD and doing so seemingly in spite of compelling reasons to be going the other way. So in May, we can see that there is the start of the RBA rate hike cycle. Now, of course, the Fed is already on the move uh, delivering its own rate hike cycle. So Perhaps there is something there um, in terms of relative vigor, uh, and maybe that's why we get further weakness. Um, let's excuse that momentarily. In December, China reopens after zero COVID restrictions. We had a bit of a recovery going into it. The actual announcement seemingly did next to nothing. The trend unchanged. The SVB-led banking crisis was very negative for the U.S. dollar in most pockets, not so much for the Australian dollar, though. And so we have seemingly this down move that is impervious to local news and seemingly just wants to go where it wants to go. So what is going on here? Why is the Australian dollar doing this? Well, let's consider uh, what we are seeing here alongside other influences. So you can see that from about the beginning of 2022, so early last year, you have an increasingly close relationship between the Australian dollar and the Bloomberg Commodity Index industrial metals sub uh, gauge. So what we're looking at here in the dark line is essentially uh, the industrial metals complex um, benchmarked. So copper, zinc, uh, iron, ore, steel, that kind of thing. And of course, Australia is a huge exporter, in particular of iron ore, but of metals, and in particular of industrial metals. Uh, much is made of Australia's exports of gold, but it's really the industrial metals that um, are the big story here, um, as is coal. Uh, coal is another big one, but it's really the industrial metals that dominate. And what we see here is these things weren't moving very closely going into the start of last year and have increasingly coupled. Um, and so there is 
seemingly an increased sensitivity to global input demand from the, uh, the Australian dollar. In other words, as you get a decline in the industrial metals from early 2022, so too you have a decline in the Aussie dollar, ostensibly because with the decline of industrial metals, you have the decline for what is Australia's biggest export sector. And the loss of that demand mean, means the loss of demand for Aussie dollars to buy those exports from Australian producers. Now, why is that occurring? Let's unpack this chart here. The columns are a 60-day percent change correlation. So we're not just correlating the direction of the move up or down. We're correlating the magnitude between that industrial metals index and the Aussie. And what you can see is going into early 2022, that correlation is actually weakening. So you can see the trend is lower on that correlation. And then around March is when that situation starts to change. You break the downtrend and start building higher. Tellingly, of course, this occurs as the probability of U.S. recession starts to build. And of course, what do we know about March of last year? That's where the Fed's rate hike cycle starts. So as the Fed starts to actually lean into rate hikes, not surprisingly, those rate hikes meant to slow growth in an effort to contain inflation, the threat of recession starts to build. And we can see that as we get that threat of recession building, so too we get an increasing sensitivity for the Aussie to what might happen with industrial metals, a cyclical set of commodities. Because, of course, if the U.S., the world's largest economy, is in recession, that echoes into economic uh, impairment really across the spectrum. The U.S. is the largest single source of global demand. The greater the likelihood that you get contraction in the U.S., the less global demand there is to speak of. And the, and the less there is of that, the more assets begin to trade around recession risk and not anything domestically uh, inspired, which is exactly what we see here. The linkage between the Aussie and cyclical demand for Australian exports firms as U.S. recession odds rise, making the Aussie effectively a recession barometer. So as the Aussie declines, what you then are actually seeing is recession odds rising. And this, seemingly, is why it's impervious to some of these more positive headlines. Because the question is not so much about the RBA starting their rate hike cycle or ending it. China is opening or not. The question is, if the odds of recession in the U.S. are rising, what does that mean for the global business cycle? And there's virtually no scenario in which it means anything good. And since the U.S. is the world's largest economy, it becomes tremendously difficult to offset, in particular, by the world's second largest economy, China, which is dependent on U.S. demand for growth. Certainly not only U.S. demand, but in a very large part. Demand that is not only impaired by the dynamics that we're seeing here, rising rates, rising recession risk with those rates, but also by the legacy of a trade war going back to 2018, which has significantly impaired the supply chain between the U.S. and China. And indeed, increasingly turned some of China's biggest customers, the rich G10 economies, 
into something that's a little bit more adversarial than it had been before. So this is a story, seemingly, of the Aussie dollar flagging recession risk, much more so than uh, responding to anything at home. Now, let's contextualize all of this with the data that we have in front of us today. We're going to get the all-important Australian um, quarterly inflation report here. You can see in the uh, orange line there, what we're expecting is a move down from 7.9 uh, or 7.8, uh, excuse me, to 6.9% on the headline CPI reading. Now, when you lag that by just a single quarter to the five-year break-even, which is um, a measure of inflation expectations implied in the bond market, that's the difference between the uh, nominal and real yield over a five-year window, which, when you subtract one from the other, gives you the magnitude of the inflation adjustment that gets you from nominal to real. Uh, and so uh, what you get, then, is the bond market's real-time inflation forecast, which, understandably, runs ahead of official data. First of all, because the official data is only published four times a year, quarterly. Um, there is now a monthly indicator, but the RBA has made a, a point of saying it's focused on the quarterly numbers to set its policy. So you have here a uh, Aussie dollar that gets basically four policy-relevant CPI updates a year. So there's a slowdown in the way the data is collected. And of course, the markets are inherently forward-looking. So what you see in the bond market should run faster than uh, CPI releases, and the market should be anticipating the turns. So you can see that when you lag the CPI numbers by a quarter to five-year break-evens, you can see those break-evens have topped some time ago already which means that the inflation overshoot that we've seen here has looked long in the tooth and is about ripe, given sort of how these curves line up, for a correction, which would be in line with what the expectations here are calling for. It gets more dramatic when we look at the relationship between CPI and housing. Housing is uh, about a third of the uh, Australian CPI basket, so a very key component here. And you can see housing has been aggressively moving lower uh, and is now outright shrinking. So when you look at the year-on-year -year change uh, in housing prices, we're talking about double-digit losses here toward the tail end of last year, which is the latest data that we have. You can see that seems to run about five quarters, or about a year and three months, ahead of CPI. And here, too, there appears to be a turn that's already being telegraphed. So the way for Australian CPI here seems to be, if these relationships hold, lower because the top is already being carved out. Now, here we have Australia's Economic Surprise Index. This is from Citigroup, and as ever, it measures the gap between realized data outcomes and what the outcomes were expected to be by uh, the sort of collective wisdom of economists, market watchers, analysts, strategists that are polled by the likes of Bloomberg, Reuters, and other data aggregators. You can see that here, the index is moving very much lower. So what you're seeing is Australian economic data is tending to underperform relative to expectations. The margin has seemingly stabilized a little bit in recent weeks, but we're nevertheless below zero, which means that the tendency for Australian data is to be weaker. The tendency seems to suggest that Analysts' models are too rosy still. 
for the reality that the Australian economy is giving them. Hence the downtrend in the index, which of course raises the specter of a downside surprise. So not only might we get the deceleration that we're looking at here, but we might get a bigger one if we continue to surprise on the downside. In practical terms, what this means is perhaps a shift lower on policy expectations. So you can see here that the yield curve is relatively unchanged uh, from about a week ago. This is uh, the market implied rate curve. You can see we're currently at 3.6. Uh, we're flirting with the possibility of maybe approaching another hike with about an 80% uh, chance, 70, 80% uh, chance by three months' time. So you can see we've priced in th uh, a rate of 3.76. That's um, about 16 basis points over where we are now. So 10 basis points, nine basis points uh, shy of uh, of baking in another full hike. So you can see here, we drift a little bit upward, but ultimately, we do not have another rate hike in the cards here, at least as far as it is baked in. We peak at about 3.7, which is essentially just a hair above where we are now within a year's time. And then there is an aggressive rate cut cycle that shaves about 70 basis points off the main r rate and brings us down to three. And that's where we ultimately linger um, for the subsequent uh, sort of three-year window. Now, you can see that the curve, the, the solid line there is the current curve. The big dashed one is uh, from the last RBA uh, announcement, which is about a month ago now, and the little dashed line is a week ago. So you can see things are fairly stable from a week ag uh, ago to now. There hasn't really been a meaningful adjustment. From the last RBA meeting, the setting seems to have become a little bit more hawkish, a little bit more steep. If we get a disappointing CPI number, that would be indicative, perhaps, that this shift in the curve is off sides and needs to shift back in. That would be something that would be ostensibly negative for the Aussie dollar. It is, of course, coming at a time when we are increasingly worried about growth and we are watching the Aussie dollar be a kind of recession indicator because it is following these cyclical commodities seemingly um, at the expense of paying attention to anything domestic very much. And so here's uh, the 6A future. We find ourselves at a decision point. You can see the long downward bar there today. That's this right here. That would be the risk aversion that we're seeing in markets today. Stocks are down, uh, yields are down. We're watching um, a broad-based liquidation. Uh, and that's the reflection of that recession barometer risk. Fed rate high odds are down, and if that were the full story, we might have even expected the Aussie to rally, much as it did uh, as Fed rate high odds were stabilizing in the back half of last year and going into the first quarter of this year. That would be this rally here. And of course, you'll find this same rally in stock markets. You'll find this same rally in gold. You'll find this same rally across the spectrum of assets that reflect Fed policy expectations and that are essentially a uh, mirror image of how those expectations evolve. You can see then, as U.S. economic data and um, initially, U.S. economic data starts getting better in February, and then as 
the uh, SVB crisis engulfs markets, Fed rate high odds collapse. But what you actually get is a stronger do U.S. dollar. Here. You can see as you get into the beginning of March, this is the, the start of the SVB crisis, things stall, but at no point do you really rally. And now as the risk aversion comes back, the Aussie is weaker, the dollar is stronger, even as Fed rate hike odds decline. That would be the Aussie behaving as a recession barometer, once again, weaker as the markets are shaken, weaken as you get risk aversion. If on top of this, we likewise get a weak CPI number, we may have the fuel we need to break out of this range. That would both signal weakness for uh, the Aussie, even as it wouldn't break any meaningful new ground in domestic uh, conditions, it would signal that recession risk is hitting fever pitch. So if the Aussie were to resume its sell-off here, the upshot would be not only that there is a problem in Australia, but that there is a problem for stocks, that there is a, a problem for cyclical commodities, be they copper or crude oil or nat gas, special though that one is, um, for uh, really the spectrum of risky assets, cryptocurrencies, uh, higher yielding currencies like uh, the Canadian dollar or the New Zealand dollar, uh, it would mean probably a stronger yen because bond yields would be going down in a risk-off scenario as capital goes to the safety of bonds, prices go up, yields come down. Certainly the uh, marking down of Fed uh, rate cuts to something more sizable against the backdrop of this risk aversion today, helpful in that same yields down, yen up direction. Clearly it'd be something supportive for the US dollar as we can see uh, plainly on the screen. And so the Aussie then becomes not just a trade, not just a currency, not just an asset onto itself, but an indicator. So if it has the conviction to break down here, given what its drivers are, we're probably looking at a much bigger risk aversion shift around the broader markets. Line in the sand being tested here at 66.37. Under that is the support zone, 68.24 to about 60, um, 68 or uh, 65. Uh, 56, rather. Um, so call it um, plus or minus uh, 65, 50, 60 or so. If you can break that, the next level of support seemingly 63, 72. Underneath that, 61, 81, the major low from last year. And that is macro money for today. Thank you very much for joining me. As ever, uh, I am here Monday through Thursday, right after overtime with friend of the show, Chris Vecchio, ahead of Futures and Forex here at Tasty Live. Also on with Tom and Tony on Sundays for First Call and on with Chris on Fridays for Futures Power Hour. Outside of those shows, I am on uh, Twitter at Ilya Spivak and uh, opining there. Thanks very much for joining. Good luck trading out there. Take care. See you tomorrow.